Hi folks, today's video is going to be about web-based applications that can monitor your LAN devices that are connected to the LAN and give you some sort of an alert via email or whatever the case is if there are new devices or unknown devices that appear on your network. So this may be of interest, you know, to those of you running home networks with phones, laptops, tablets, whatever connected. And you want to know maybe if, you know, there's a unauthenticated device that's now attached itself or your neighbors hacked into your Wi-Fi or whatever the case is. So, you know, I was just looking at something that could run in the background and just give me this sort of alert. Because, yes, it is available on the router. If you go look it up on the router, you can see the list of devices, but you can't do it, you know, all the time. So you want really something ideally that's going to run in the background, either on a Raspberry Pi or on a server or in a Docker container somewhere. So I did narrow it down to two basic applications. I did see a video by DB Tech on a product called Watch Your LAN. So that was one I went and had a look at. And then I also looked at this one, Pi Alert. So just I did a sort of a comparison of the two really, because these are the two that I found that sort of were basically doing what I was looking for. My criteria really was I wanted proper alerting, preferably either by notification to my mobile device or via email at least. So maybe my comparison could also help you decide which ones you want to use. They do a similar thing, but they do it in a different way. So you know maybe this might help you if you are busy trying to choose between the two of them at least. So the comparison that I've done here is I've got Watch Your Land on the left side here and I've got Pi Alert on the right hand side. Clearly what you're going to see immediately here is very much lower resources on Watch Your LAN. Its maximum CPU, as far as my Docker containers went, was 0.4%. And it averaged around about 5.6 megs of RAM, so extremely light. Pilot, on the other hand, was a little bit heavier. It maxed when it was running scans at about 9% CPU and ran average of about 250 megabytes of RAM. Then the other key differentiator was what was available for notifications. And this primarily sort of helped me decide to a certain extent. So Watch Your LAN has got notifications that make use of Grouper. I would take it you pronounce that. Was it Grouper? But anyway, it took me a little while to try to figure out how Grouper worked. In fact, I didn't get it to work properly. But... A key difference as well is that you've got to set this up, or that's how I pick it up anyway, in some of the container variables that you pass through to the container when you create the stack or create the container. So it's not as flexible as you'll see here on PyAlert where you can just do it in a config file. So that was the first thing. I set it up for just to start with, just for email, and I didn't get the email to authenticate properly. It just gave me authentication errors, and I've tried two different ways of doing it, and it didn't quite, I didn't quite get it to work. So I, I imagine it does work. I didn't understand something, or I didn't do something right, and maybe I didn't spend long enough on it, but that was the one aspect there. On the PyAlert side, what I did like was, for, as I've already mentioned, it's in the config file, so that's quite easy to configure and set up, but in the config file, it gives you a couple of different options. One is email, and I got that to work first time, no problem, in the same manner that I tried the other one. It's got webhooks. It's got AppRise, or is it App, AppRise? I'm not sure. I think it's AppRise, which is also a notification service. It's got something quite interesting called NTFY, which is probably for Notify. And what I found about Notify is what's interesting is it's fairly open. So it's not, it's an open source product, by the way, as well. But it's not secure. So I don't use this for secure things. But if it, it's very much like MQTT protocol, where you broadcast to a topic, which you determine whatever the name of the topic is, and you subscribe to that topic to listen to it. Well, Notify is exactly the same. In your config file, you give it whatever you want to make the topic name. And then on your Android phone or on your iPhone, you will install this app, the NTFY app, and you'll just subscribe to that same topic name. So obviously, if anybody else subscribes to the same topic name, they're going to probably get your alerts. But you see what I mean? It's very, very easy to get going. There's no cost. Uh, for this sort of purpose, I don't think there's very much problem. I'll show you just now what the notification does look like. And then there's also the service Push Safer. 
So Push Safer, as far as I remember, is the one where you pay a once or five dollar per client platform. So if you've got two iPhones, you would pay once and you could use it, or iOS devices, I suppose, uh, iPad and iPhone, you'd pay five dollars once off and then you'd use that as your push notification service. It could also work though to email and desktop and various other things. So a couple of good options that are quite flexible over there for Pi Alert. Then the other big differentiator probably, and this explains why the resources are much lower on Watch Your Land. It's a very basic product. It really just shows you any new identities that pop up and it can send a notification if you get the group one notifications working. That, that's it really. On the Pi Alert side, very much more comprehensive. So you've got things like new identities and offline notifications. In other words, if the device goes offline, you can be notified as well and you can set that per device. So that may be, for example, you might want to know if a certain device disappears off the network, for example. You've got presence graphs, you've got event history, you can export the device list to a CSV file, back up your database, and you've got some maintenance tasks and so on that you can also perform. Then on the scanning front, again, a slight difference. Both do ARP scan. So ARP scan really just is a, a service that scans for IP4 devices that are present on the network. It's used in a couple of different products like this anyway. So no big difference there really. And whatever the shortcomings are of ARP Stan, that counts for both of these products as well. For example, I've got a lithium battery pack that sits on my Wi-Fi network as well. That does not respond to a ping and it therefore doesn't get picked up in the scan. So you know that's just something to bear in mind. But you've also got some other alternatives here with Pi Alert. So it, if you've got Pi Hole installed, which is that DNS service, then it can make use of that as well to pull information from what devices are connected and their descriptions. Or it can use DNS mask with the DHCP leases, you know, that will also show devices that were connected recently and uh, may have disconnected but were present, for example. So that's, you know, a couple of alternatives there again that Pilot will pick up. So it's a bit more thorough in actually finding devices, if you want to put it that way. And then lastly, also just how do they install? What are the options? Well, Watch Your LAN is Docker container only, which is for me great. That's fine, but it's not going to run just plainly on a, on a Raspberry Pi as far as I can see. Whereas Pi Alert will run in a Docker container. It can also install on Linux or it can run on a Raspberry Pi itself. In fact, it was designed for a Raspberry Pi. So the Docker container really just sort of wraps it and runs it in a Docker container. I can just mention briefly something else that's interesting here. There is another product, and this is the GitHub address, who is in my LAN. It essentially looks like it's almost forked or based off Watch Your LAN. And this guy's just added one or two additional options like authentication and so on, and better notification services. But the downside here is for me anyways, I'm using an iPhone. It uses GNotify only at this stage, and that is an Android only, so it doesn't go to iOS and it doesn't go to email, I don't think, I'm not sure. But anyway, that was just why I didn't get to looking at that one in the end. So let's just have a look at the performance stats. You can see this is for Watch Your LAN. And you can see that this just gives you an idea of sort of how much RAM it was using the whole time while it was running. It did sort of build up to around about five megs or so of RAM. And you can just see short little peaks here, percentage-wise, when it was doing a, when it was doing scans. And then Pilot, which was the slightly heavier one, Pilot up there, you can see it was running basically stable at around about just over 200 megabits. And when it did its scans, it used a little bit more memory over there. And you can see on the CPU side here, idling at basically zero, but scans could peak at around about 10%, just to give an indication of how heavy these two applications are. I should also just say that I had a tremendous problem with Pilot in the beginning. It was running at about 3.6 gigabytes of RAM and building up to that point quite steadily. And what I discovered was the issue there really was that the file permissions were not correct in my container. Because when you create this container, and I'll show you just before we finish, I'll show you the 
config files that I used. You, the way that I set it up was I opted to create manually create the directory and place the conf file, the database default file, and the version file manually into those directories. And I wasn't careful enough to check what permissions my container was actually using for the application side, and I had a mismatch there. Once I realized that and I changed it to match the same username and group name uh, permissions, that once I rebooted, pop, that was it. Memory problem was sorted out. So just something to watch out for if you have a similar problem there. This is an example of an email that PyAlert does send. So in this case, it sent an email to say that it had picked up my Kindle. And it obviously pulled that name through from the DNS or from the router DNS anyway, because I hadn't put this into PyAlert at all. That is literally how it detected it as a, a new device. And it did detect also a bit quicker than Watch Your LAN. So I think let's go onto the interfaces and have a look at them. That is what Watch Your LAN looks like. That's the landing page. I'd already marked when it starts, all these will be shown as no for known in yellow, uh, like these over here. And you can basically just tick it to known, fill in the name over here, and it'll pop up into this list up at the top here. And it's as easy as that. That is all you have to do. And the only other things you really can do is change the theme. You can filter on offline or online and go back to this page, which is home, and search over there. So that, that is pretty well much it. This is just an example showing you that it picked up my laptop as a new device. I haven't configured it yet. So all I'm going to do is I could say to it here, for example, Donny laptop. And I'd say, yes, it's a known device. And you'll see it should pop up here somewhere now. Should. I don't see it. Let me just refresh maybe. Oh, you know what? It's actually offline. I've disconnected the laptop. That's why. Sorry. So th these are probably the online devices over here that I showed. But you'll see down here now, wherever I typed it in. Uh, there you go. That line over there. You'll see it is it is now marked. If it comes online again, it will it will appear. So that's basically it. That in a nutshell is what you'll land. In Pilot, quite a bit more comprehensive. The landing page here on devices, it's got some filters at the top. You can, obviously I'm on all devices, but you could filter on just connected, your favorites, one new device over there. If there's anything down and you've got alerts set, it'll show you over there. And if you've archived any devices, it also gives you a summary of the presence for the last couple of hours, I think, or the last day. And there's, of course, your list of devices. So one of the differences you're gonna find on devices is if you, if you click here on the device, this is the device view that you've got. So you can set, obviously, a cup, it pulls in, obviously, the MAC address. You can fill in the, the name. You can choose an owner, what type of device it is. The vendor's automatically filled in. You can put it into a group. You can also put it into a location. You can put comments over here. You can say which network device it is connected to. So these are obviously also picked up as devices, but I've defined them as routers when you see over here. Is it here? No. Type. If you've selected something like uh, access point or router, then I think that's how it seems to appear over there. And you can also specify which port as well. Then this is all filled in automatically for you, but I can state that this, because it's got a DHCP allocation, it's a static IP address, you can also here tick this on as a static IP, then it's not going to keep looking for MAC addresses, it'll just know on that IP address that this is the device. It's got some scan time settings, and you can either say don't scan, or you can say scan, I think this is scan, it's a one minute scan. I, oh, I can't remember now exactly. But anyway, the, the project does talk about it. I know the, in the main project, not in the container that one is, there is an option for 15 minutes. Oh, I think it's if it's gone for a longer than a certain period. So for Apple devices, they recommend making that the option 15, which allows a longer time for it to sort of come and go on the network before it realizes that it's disconnected or it's missing. For some reason, that is not enabled in the container edition. 
There was a reason I see for it. It might come back, but it's not on. So I've just really got everything on one minute. If you say alert all events, then it's going to send you an email or alert notification for every time this device is on or off or present or missing or whatever the case is. I, it can be a bit much, but you can have that option. This is where you'll tick on if you just want to get alerts if it's offline or down. And this is quite nice. You can just say to it, send me every single event as it happens or don't send me events unless something else happens an hour later or eight hours later or so 24 hours. This just stops you getting you know, lots of repeat notifications. If it's a new device, it's going to pop up here with this ticked like that as a new device. So obviously, one of the things you'll be doing is when you've identified it all over here, you're going to just untick that and say, okay, it's not a new device anymore. And that's where you'd archive it if you want to. The random Mac here is certain devices like iPhones and Androids and certain other things now have got a privacy setting on Wi-Fi where it'll randomize its MAC address. So devices that use a MAC address only to identify it can make things a little bit difficult to recognize. So this will be highlighted here if it is a random MAC address. What you can do is you can disable your random MAC address per network that you connect to. So on my iPhone and on my iPad and on my wife's Android phone, I have disabled that randomization or that private addressing for just the specific Wi-Fi network. So it just makes it easier for tracking. It does a pretty good job anyway, I've noticed, of tracking them regardless, actually, because I think it is using the presence and the fact that the IP address is still saying the same. To, to recognize the device, but just to bear in mind that is where it is. And there's obviously little help things you can tick over here. You can also delete the device, clear events, or reset changes, and that's obviously where you'll save it if you've made any changes. Then on each device, you can also do an end map. You can scan, in other words, ports. Do port scan. You can do default detail scans. You can check what sessions this thing's had. You can check its presence as well and any particular events logged so you can see a lot lot more detail and that's obviously hence why you know the resources are a little bit heavier oops uh did i save something i don't know okay let's say they save so that's editing a particular device then or we can maybe just show you quickly this is the asus laptop that came up, it's also identified it here as new, and you'll see there it hasn't got any information allocated yet to it. So if I was to click on that now, I will untick the new device. I can say there the owner is me. I can change that description there if I want to. It is a laptop. I can mark it as favorite if I want to. I can just say it's a personal device. Uh, well, it hasn't got a location at the moment. The next to the home router, I don't want to log all events. And if it does log things, don't tell me for another hour. And that's basically it. Save. And that is it. You'll see now if you go back down wherever the laptop is. There it is. There it's got all this information in. And it is offline. But as I said, when it connects again, it'll appear. Uh, just a note about the online and offline. So yes, that is partly a problem. Some of these devices go to sleep. Wi-Fi specifically, you'll see a lot of the time these things often show offline, like the Google Home speakers and uh, I think our Ring doorbell as well. A couple of things do go to sleep, so yeah, that is part of the issue with Wi-Fi really. But the nice thing with this is, you know, even if a device comes on an hour or two later, it's monitoring in the background the whole time and then it will give you an alert. So you can look at a summary of presence per device. You can also look at uh, global events if you're tracking them. On the network side, you can choose by device to see what's connected to each one. If you put the port numbers in, it would also show the port numbers there as well. Then you've really got some maintenance options here. This shows you if there's a scan happening at the moment. I've got three backups. You can change language over there and apply it. You can choose different skins. You can toggle dark and light mode. You can also disable the op scan. It will stay disabled, but as it says here, active scans are not cancelled. They will still happen every 15 minutes or 
whatever the case is for the scans. And then on the tools side, you've got a couple of cleanup options here as well that can just help with, you know, if there's any particular problems with devices and that sort of thing, deleting of devices, devices with empty Macs, uh, Mac addresses, that sort of thing. And there's your, your backups. You can purge backups. You can do the CSV export over there, as I've mentioned, and import as well of devices if you've got it. And quite nicely, they've got built-in help here inside the application. So it's another nice sort of touch as well, I think, really. And that really is the devices. I just want to show you then really the source code or the code that I used because it may help others if you are setting it up. I've put the source code now into Pastebin, so I will put links to this below the video as well. Maybe we can just look at Watch Your Land firstly. So Watch Your Land, this is the Docker Compose file that you'd use to set up this application. And there's nothing really very strange in here. Uh, it is important just to note on your network mode, and it's the same for the other one. You do need to be working on the host network or defaulting to host or local network, not the Docker networks, because you won't be picking up all the devices elsewhere on your router's LAN. Obviously, here on volumes, that's the one thing that I did have to change. So the left side of the little colon over there is the mapping on my own physical server. That's the server address. The one on the right, you don't touch the slash data. That is inside the container. That'll always stay the same. And then on the environment side, really, the only thing that I changed here was the time zone and the network interface. So that is the network interface in my case on my server which i'm using and i think there is a command that you can run i made a note of it oh, probably on the the other one when we get to it now but this is the problem that i had so the shouter url is essentially this as i could understand it it's the string that you need to put in that it needs to execute and I did put in as faithfully as I could. Obviously, I put my real login ID over there, password with the domain name and the port number, the from address and the to address. But like I said, it didn't work for me. So if anybody's got any ideas around that, please let me know because I don't really know how Shata works. And then this label was just an optional thing I added in for Watchtower to look for updates for me. And yeah, I did mention that over there. There's the, the link to go and find the shouter details. Then the other one is the Pi Alert. So I've got two here. This is the Docker Compose file. And again, I think the only things I like to put my container name and host name in over there. I think the ports were standard. Basically, that's the external port for the container and this is the container's own internal port that it listens to time zone this might vary for you you don't have to put in user id and group id but if you want to set particular user permissions then this is what you'd use actually if i'd left these two out i might not have had those permissions problems so just bear in mind that that relates to permissions to read and write on that volume that you've mapped there again is network mode host for the local network. Uh, my label again for watchtower checking. And they're the two volumes that are mapped. So inside the container, there's a home pi pi alert db location. And then there's also a config location. So you keep those the same, leave those. And obviously on the server side, I just use the same subfolder. No need to for me to make really separate subfolders. So they map into the same location. And I did have a link over here where that comes from, where the link is back to the project. Let's just have a look at their config file. This is the name of the config file. So how you have to set this container up is this file along with the version file and along with the default database file get copied into that mapped location on your server and there's a couple of things you just have to tweak really in the config file 
Again, most of this I left exactly as is. I just changed the time zone. I left this, but this is where you would set this to true with a password here if you want to have a login protection. I'm running this always on my LAN and I use OpenVPN to drop into the LAN if I'm outside the LAN. So I don't worry with this really, but that's where you'd set it. This is where you do your email settings in the config file. And this is mostly for Gmail. If you were using Gmail, you would just obviously put your own email address in there, your login password. You don't want to skip TLS and login, so you might leave those as false. And do you want mail reporting? Yes, true. And you put the to address in over there. And that, that's basically it for email. That's all you have to do. Webhook I didn't use, but you'd set that to true. The app rise settings, if you were going to use, set to true. This is what I use, notify. So I set that to true. And here, I literally just put in the topic. So you could call this anything, pie alerts, or you know, other people might have used that. Make it something unique, you know, with maybe your name pie alerts, something like that. You'd put that in over there. And that's it. This one is also, you'd set to true over there. Din DNS, I didn't use. That was also to look up, I think, the DNS names. Piehole, I don't have active. I'm using AdGuard Home. But if you did have it, you'd set that to true and you'd put your paths and your things there. And this is the last part. This is just telling it what to scan. Sorry, over there. So you can tell it to scan specific or different subnets over here. But otherwise, by default, you could just have this. That, that, that will work to scan your local network. And this is how long you keep events by default. And that really is it. Uh, this is the one comment I just wanted to mention here. If you want to check your the name of your network interface, then you would go to your command line and you would just run IP link show. And just below where you've got loopback, normally that will be the, the following one that says broadcast and multi something or other. That is normally the main interface that you could use. So just take, take note of that name and you would use that then to specify. Like in my case, that was the name of my interface, ENP4S0. So what I actually ran, just to test this, I went to the command line and I went and ran it manually just to see you know, if I got back the list of IP addresses and it's working. So you can also just run that and see. Or in many cases, what would also work is just sudo arp-scan and then space dash l for list. And that will also just, or is it dash l for, dash l for local, sorry, will actually do the scan for you as well. And that really is, is it. But just before I go, I can just show you quickly what the mobile actually looks like as well. So this is just showing the scrolling through on the PyAlert website, just to give you a feel for what it actually looks like. It works just as well on mobile as well. And if you just press on, say, favorites, it'll then also filter on, on that for you. A similar sort of view. And then just to show what the alerts look like, this is the notify alerts that are running on the iPhone. It pops up as a push notification. I hope you found that sort of interesting. If it is something that you're interested in scanning your devices just to see, you know, what pops up but you're not aware of and that it can give you an alert, then hopefully this, these two are worth having a look at. If there are any others that I've maybe missed that should do what I've just described or what I was talking about, what I was looking for, then maybe drop me a note as well in the comments, and I'll be interested to look at it as well. But for those that are interested, hopefully this is something that you could make use of. And with that, that is actually the end of the video. So stay safe out there, and thanks for watching, and I'll see you in my next video.